On September 2nd, 1913, screams and a violent struggle break the silence of a small apartment in New York City. Things are quiet again for a few moments, until the metallic clanging of cutting tools begin to accompany sounds of blood dripping and flesh being butchered. The subject works diligently to package his work and prepare its delivery to the Hudson River, where he would sink the remnants of a woman and the unborn child still inside her. As he hauls the pillowcase full of human body parts out of the apartment, moonlight briefly illuminates the cross and white collar around his neck. This was no ordinary psychopath, but a so-called man of faith. Welcome to Vice Confidential, where we peel back the layers of the most disturbed minds known throughout history. Today, we explore the infamous case of the Killer Priest, a demon living among those we consider the most holy in early 1900s America. Our story begins in the quaint German town of Aschaffenburg, where a peculiar child named Hans Schmidt came into the world in the year 1881. From an early age, he exhibited an eerie fascination that set him apart from his peers. While other children reveled in innocent games and laughter, Hans found solace at the local slaughterhouse. A disquieting habit took hold of young Hans, as he would spend his afternoons transfixed in a deranged curiosity as cows and pigs met their grisly ends right before his eyes. The grotesque process of death and butchery seemed to captivate his imagination during his early years. Yet, there was another side to Hans, on the opposite side of the spectrum, the allure of the sacred. The boy found himself drawn to the solemn rituals of the Roman Catholic Church. Enraptured by its pageantry and mysticism, in the solitude of his room, he would fashion a makeshift altar and play the role of priest, engrossed in a world of reverence and sacraments. Little did anyone suspect that these seemingly innocuous childhood passions would one day intertwine in a disturbing convergence. The seeds of darkness sown within his useful mind would bear a rotten fruit, forever altering the lives of those who crossed paths with Hans Schmidt. As the years passed and Hans matured into a man, the union of his fascination with death and his yearning for the sacred would soon reveal the true extent of his nature. In 1904, an ambitious Hans Schmidt donned the vestments of priesthood, ready to embark on a journey dedicated to serving the faithful. But his path would be far from smooth, marked by a series of confrontations and unsettling relocations that foreshadowed the dark chapters that lay ahead. For four years, Schmidt diligently carried out his clerical duties in his native Germany. However, the clash of ideologies and disagreements with his superiors marred his tenure, forcing him to seek a fresh start elsewhere. This pattern of confrontation and escape was a prelude to the malevolent acts that awaited. Four years later, Schmidt found himself transferred to St. John's Parish in Louisville, Kentucky, seeking solace and a new beginning in the land of opportunity. Yet, his presence stirred unrest among the Catholic leaders of the parish, igniting a volatile atmosphere that would prove untenable. The clash of egos and differing versions of faith forced Schmidt to once again uproot his life. Like a dark specter moving from one shadowed corner to another, he arrived at St. Boniface Church, nestled on the east side of Midtown Manhattan. It was a place of hopes and dreams, a sanctuary for the devout seeking solace in the bustling metropolis. They had welcomed not only a troubled priest, but also a young Austrian housekeeper named Anna Almuller. Anna, a recent addition to the St. Boniface community, possessed a spirit as vibrant as her origins. Unbeknownst to her, fate had connected her path with that of a true demon. Before we move on, please take a moment to support our channel by liking this video, subscribing, and ringing the bell to receive notifications of all of our upcoming content focusing on history's most gruesome characters. Now, let's continue. Within the sacred confines of St. Boniface Church, the two formed a forbidden bond destined for a tragic fate. Hans Schmidt, the priest with a pensions for upheaval, and Anna Almuller, the Austrian housekeeper, surrendered to the irresistible pull of desire, embarking on a dangerous affair. As their passionate entanglement intensified, Schmidt's pattern of relocation persisted, casting suspicion over his intentions. The authorities within the church, aware of the illicit affair, sought to prevent the scandal from tarnishing their holy institution. Consequently, Schmidt found himself transferred to St. Joseph's Church in West Harlem, a desperate attempt to distance him from the whispers that swirled in his wake. But the flames of forbidden love cannot easily be extinguished. Despite the physical distance between them, the bond between Schmidt and Almuller remained unyielding. 
Undeterred by the constraints of their circumstances, the star-crossed lovers hatched a daring plan. On February 26, 1913, within the shadows of secrecy, Hans Schmidt performed a marriage ceremony that united him with Anna Almuller. In a clandestine affair conducted by the very hand that should have been devoted to serving a higher power, the couple defied the laws of the church and society. The vows exchanged in that ceremony marked not only the union of their hearts, but also the culmination of transgressions that would echo through the annals of true crime. Aware that the revelation of his unholy matrimony in the ensuing pregnancy would undoubtedly bring his priestly facade crashing down, Schmidt confronted the grim reality that his days within the church were numbered. In the depths of his depravity, he resolved that no trace of his transgressions could be allowed to surface. With a 12-inch butcher knife clutched tightly in his hand, Schmidt turned on the unsuspecting Almuller. In a savage act of brutality, he slashed her delicate throat, extinguishing her life in an instant. But the depths of his madness knew no bounds. Schmidt, driven by a deranged compulsion to eradicate any evidence of his heinous act, reached for a hacksaw. With callous determination, he cut Almuller's head from her lifeless body forever severing the ties that bound them. In a grotesque display of calculated barbarity, Schmidt meticulously dismembered the remains. Each section of the corpse was methodically wrapped within newspaper clippings from August 31st, the date that marked the final remnants of Amelor's existence. The lower half of the body, encased within a monogrammed pillowcase adorned with the initial A, bore a grim weight, as a large piece of gray-green rock called schist, collected by Schmidt himself, was tethered to each segment. With a heart devoid of remorse, Schmidt embarked on a mission to dispose of the evidence of his monstrous crime. He ventured to the Hudson River, where he cast the parcels into its depths, counting on the weight of the schist to drag them to the river's abyss. The waters of the Hudson concealed the ghastly truth that lay beneath its surface. Three days later, on the shores of the New Jersey side of the Hudson, a startling discovery was made. Two children stumbled upon the upper torso of a woman, a sight that would forever haunt their memories. Three miles downstream, in the waters of Weehawken, New Jersey, the lower section of Anna Almuller's dismembered body was found, still confined within the pillowcase adorned with her monogram and the weight of the schist. The cruelty of Hans Schmidt had exposed a level of depravity that defied comprehension. The tranquil waters of the Hudson River had become the final resting place for the remains of Anna Almuller. The tragic end of their secret affair would leave an indelible mark on the collective consciousness, a morbid reminder of how deep humanity can sink. As this case extended across state lines, the discovery of the dismembered body in New Jersey triggered a relentless pursuit of justice. Although the remains were unearthed in the Garden State, it was the New York Police Department that took charge of the investigation, recognizing the significance of the evidence that had come to light. A peculiar clue emerged from the forensic examination. Schist, a rare rock predominantly found in Manhattan, the absence of such geological formations in New Jersey bolstered the belief that this murder had happened in New York City. Armed with this vital piece of information, the investigations dug deeper. An autopsy of the severed body parts provided further insights, casting a somber light upon the life that had been so brutally extinguished. It revealed that the victim was a woman under 30 years old, standing approximately 5 foot 4 inches tall and weighing between 120 and 130 pounds. The medical examination also unveiled another truth. This unfortunate soul had experienced premature childbirth shortly before her untimely demise. The revelation of this additional tragedy only furthered the urgency to find out who was behind her savage murder. The New York Police Department, guided by their unwavering determination, focused their attention on a crucial piece of evidence, the monogrammed pillowcase. With meticulous precision, the detectives embarked on a painstaking journey to trace the origins of this ominous item that bore the letter A. Their efforts were rewarded. The intricate monogram provided an important lead, bringing the authorities to a specific company renowned for its personalized textiles. With this information, the detectives turned their attention to the business records maintained by the company. The trail led them to the humble abode of Anna Almuller, the Austrian housekeeper who had found herself ensnared by her lover, the priest turned murderer. Her apartment walls whispered secrets that would finally expose the grim reality of what had transpired. With trepidation gripping their hearts, the officers followed the landlord of the property, stepping into a scene that defied comprehension. The air hung heavy with the metallic scent of blood, mingling with the pungent aroma of cleansers, 
that had desperately fought against the stains. Despite the landlord's futile attempts to restore normalcy, the walls and floor bore witness to a violent struggle, each splatter of crimson bearing testament to a life that was ripped away. The officer's eyes fell upon a sink adorned with the remnants of a desperate cleanup effort. A scrubbing brush and six bars of soap stood as silent witnesses to Schmidt's attempts to erase the traces of his despicable act. The relentless scrubbing had yielded some success, for the butcher's knife and handsaw were devoid of the telltale signs of violence. Concealed within a hidden recess, the tools of murder laid dormant. As the officers explored further, their gaze fell upon a trunk brimming with damning evidence. Letters bearing the name of Almuller unveiled a correspondence that entwined her with Schmidt. References to his employment at St. Joseph's served as a chilling reminder of the sinister duality that lurked beneath the facade of a holy man. Nestled amongst the letters, delicate handkerchiefs, meticulously embroidered with the haunting initial A, mirrored the monogram that had tied Amalur to her gruesome demise. Within the confines of this grisly crime scene, the officers unearthed an unforgettable tale of deception and depravity. As the pieces of this harrowing puzzle fell into place, a clearer picture emerged. Inspector Faro, accompanied by his steadfast partner, ventured into the hallowed halls of St. Joseph's Church in the face of unspeakable horror. Their aim was to extract answers from Hans Schmidt, whose name was associated with the blood-soaked crime of the apartment. In a shocking turn of events, the once priest swiftly confessed to the unholy union and subsequent murder of Anna Almuller. As the words tumbled from his lips, Schmidt's gripping proclamation rang through the air. Quote, I loved her. Sacrifices should be consummated in blood. Unquote. Justice was put in motion culminating in Schmidt's trial, which commenced on December 7, 1913. With the question of his guilt cast aside, the defense resorted to an audacious strategy, claiming Schmidt had succumbed to an insatiable bloodlust, rendering him incapable of discerning right from wrong. For 23 arduous days, Schmidt and his legal team clung to the thread of insanity, weaving a narrative that sought to shield him from the full weight of his actions. Their hunger for scandal and intrigue driving them to erect a metaphorical circus tent around the courthouse. Yellow journalism seized upon every salacious detail, narrating the chilling tale to an enraptured audience. The media spectacle grew in intensity, each twist and turn of the trial amplified by the ink-stained pages that held the public's imagination. Amidst the chaos that swirled outside the courthouse, a battle for justice unfolded within its hallowed halls. Schmidt, cunning and calculating, managed to steer the proceedings in his desired direction. The plea of insanity seduced the minds of two jurors, casting doubt upon the collective verdict. The trial culminated in a chilling stalemate, a hung jury with the vote split 10 to 2, leaving Schmidt's fate hanging by a thread. The clash of legal tactics, media frenzy, and a divided jury set the stage for a riveting drama. The echoes of Schmidt's confession reverberated through the chambers as the battle for sanity and culpability waged on, ready to unleash its final chapter upon a captivated audience. It was time for a decisive showdown. The jurors, hardened by the revelations that had unfolded, could not afford to be swayed by doubt. Judge Vernon Davis, his voice full of solemn wisdom, urged against another hung jury. The stakes were higher, the gravity of their decision heavier than ever before. The weight of guilt pressed upon the accused. Hans Schmidt, an embodiment of evil, stood poised before the jurors, his fate now hanging in the balance. The evidence had finally pierced through the fabric of deceit, leaving no room for clemency. With resolute determination, the jury delivered their verdict, a resounding conviction of first-degree murder. The swift hammer of justice struck with unwavering precision, sentencing Schmidt to face the ultimate reckoning a date with the electric chair. It was a brutal punishment befitting his crimes. On February 18, 1916, as the world teetered on the precipice of a global conflict, the notorious Sing Sing prison played host to a grim spectacle. The electric current coursed through Schmidt's veins, forever severing his connection to the mortal realm. In their fervent pursuit of fresh angles to captivate the public's imagination, Reporters drilled into the hidden recesses of Schmidt's troubled past. They discovered a man haunted by a trail of unsolved crimes, each one worse than the last. It became increasingly apparent that Schmidt had skillfully eluded capture, 
shielded by a veil of public trust in the revered leaders of the church. Yet, the truth could no longer remain concealed by blind faith. A second apartment belonging to Schmidt materialized where he held an illegal operation. The place was full of illicit ambition, as a printing press churned out counterfeit money, $10 bills that held the purchasing power equivalent to a staggering $240 today. Schmidt's audacious schemes knew no bounds, for alongside the counterfeit money, he harbored a diabolical plot, one that involved a deadly alliance with a Manhattan dentist. Together, they would embark on a howling spree of murder, reaping the rewards of their nefarious deeds through fraudulent life insurance claims. Schmidt's dark machinations sent shockwaves through a society already reeling from the depths of his killings. His unprecedented criminality, reaching far and wide, wove a narrative that shook the foundations of faith and morality. As the media frenzy swirled around the ever-unfolding tale, the public became unwitting spectators to a true crime saga, a story that transcended the boundaries of imagination. With each new revelation, the innocence of Schmidt was ripped apart, exposing a web of deceit, greed, and unspeakable evil. Within St. John's Parish, another secret laid concealed beneath the hallowed grounds. It was there that the lifeless body of a nine-year-old girl was found. Suspicion coiled tightly around the parish, yet the local janitor, a hapless pawn in this corrupted game, had shouldered the burden of guilt, bearing the accusations that were not rightfully his. As the investigation continued, an eerie parallel connected the dismemberment of the young girl's body to the fate that befell Anna Almuller. The resemblance between these acts of violence were uncanny, but this horrific saga reached far beyond this particular church. With each passing day, Hans Schmidt's past grew increasingly turbulent. The tides of justice, long denied their rightful course, lapped against the shores of his hometown, Aschaffenburg. There, amidst the cobblestone streets and shadowed alleys, another body emerged, a murdered girl irrevocably linked to the name of Schmidt. But the German authorities, forever robbed of their opportunity to question him, were left with nothing but an enigma, the puzzle pieces of a cold case that refused to yield answers. It was too late, an ocean away, within the heartlands of the United States, Hans Schmidt had met his ultimate fate. The electric chair, a vessel of divine retribution, claimed him as its own. In that moment of irreversible judgment, Schmidt forever became a part of true crime history, a singular embodiment of a Catholic priest subjected to the highest punishment the nation had to offer. Did his monstrous deeds serve as an aberration, a singular event tarnishing an otherwise virtuous history? Or should we, as a society, question the blind trust bestowed upon those who lead us down the path of righteousness? As the debate rages on, be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Join us next time as Vice Confidential continues to explore the mysteries behind humanity's darkest moments. See you on the other side.